Okay, should be recording now. All right, well, folks, thank you for signing in tonight. Um, this was something that uh, we talked about doing a, a pretty long ways back, and uh, we weren't sure exactly how we were going to cover it all. Um, but it, it's kind of come together, and I, I had fun doing it, and I know Phil's had fun doing it, so uh, hopefully it'll be interesting and helpful to you. Um, tonight's subject is on emergency backcountry shelter in this part of the Woodcraft series. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what uh, people's individual needs are. And uh, the, the first thing down there is the, the physiological needs. Uh, these are things that everybody has, and uh, they, they have to be met before they can move on to other things. And so food water, warmth, and rest. And um, part of that whole uh, warmth and rest thing is shelter. And uh, if you think about if you're out in bad weather, uh, clothing is probably the, the most important thing that you would have, but followed right behind the clothing would be shelter out of the elements. And, uh, you know, if, if you're in the middle of the summer, that's not as important, but uh, through uh, the three seasons of fall, uh, winter, and spring, it, it can make the difference between life and death. So uh, shelter is very important. Um, as, as far as some of the reasons why you might need to do this, at first I thought, well, we may have people that think that this is kind of a, uh, a Boy Scout class, and, and this is just for people that want to get out and, and rough it. And that's not really the case. Um, there are a lot of different situations that could come up that might make you have to have emergency shelter. And I, I only know about some of these because I have come close to it myself. Um, there was a, a time when the Pine Mountain Trail was being developed that I was out by myself uh, trying to figure out where the trail was going to go. Uh, actually feel it was out there by that overlook uh, in Merle. Merle knows exactly where it is, uh, where we quit working at that overlook. Uh, that's kind of a false ridge. And I kept going off that false ridge um, and uh, getting confused. And I didn't have water. I didn't have food. I didn't have a lighter, a compass, a map. Um, I didn't have a jacket. And this was in February. It just happened to be a nice day and I went out and I thought I'd be okay. And it started getting really late and I had circled around back on my flag line twice. And uh, my wife called and she said, where are you? And I said, well, that's a real good question. And she said, what kind of answer is that? And I said, well, I don't know where I am. And she said, well, how can you not know where you are? And I said, well, I'm lost. And, uh, so she kind of freaked out a little bit and I said, it'll, it'll be okay. And I said, I'm going to do the opposite of what I did the last time. And if, if that doesn't fix things, I'll, I'll find a rock to get up under and spend the night and I'll see you in the morning. And uh, she was not uh, impressed with my plans, but uh, you know, it can be that you got lost. It could be that you broke a leg or you turned an ankle and you might be four or five miles uh, from the, the trailhead. And so for all those reasons, um, you, you might have a health condition that comes up. You know, maybe your blood sugar drops uh, or any number of things that might cause you to need to spend the night in the woods. And so if you do that, uh, you need to know how to uh, make shelter for yourself. And uh, so the, the, the emergency shelter thing becomes really important. I know a lot of you are ma uh, master naturalists for Phil and uh, you enjoy being outdoors uh, or you wouldn't be involved in that. And so anybody that enjoys being outdoors needs to know how to make an emergency shelter. Um, this uh, next part kind of goes along with um, the Boy Scout motto. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, uh, but it, their, their overall motto is be prepared. And uh, so uh, we hope that if you're going in the back country or going for a hike that you have thought to take a day pack or a rucksack and that you have some basic emergency supplies. And that means you have a pocket knife that's good and sharp. Uh, it's even better if it's got a saw uh, along with it. 
Um, but it means that you need to have uh, uh, a poncho, um, maybe some sort of uh, something that will keep you dry and, and could double as a source of shelter and, uh, you know, water and, and a snack or something like that. But uh, if you're prepared, then uh, what we're going to talk about tonight becomes a lot uh, simpler. Uh, if you didn't take precautions and you're having to, to totally rough it, you can still do it. It just is going to require a little more uh, thought. So uh, be prepared. It, it's always good if you take things that serve uh, kind of dual purpose or triple purpose. So give some thought to what you're carrying with you and make sure that they, uh, you know, it's not a specialized piece of equipment, but that it, it can serve a lot of different purposes. And a poncho is a great example of something that that could help you in, in a rain, but it could also help you in the event that you need to use it as an emergency uh, shelter. If you did not think to prepare, then you have to work with what's available. And uh, there are a lot of things in the woods that can help provide you shelter. Uh, you just have to think through what they are. And uh, I'm gonna stop right here and pause for a second and say that uh, people panic uh, when they're out in the woods and an emergency arises or they, they get hurt or they're lost. And they tend to, to quit using the most valuable piece of equipment they have, and that's their brain. Um, you really need to think. Uh, so if you feel that you're having that uh, panic set in where your heart starts to race and uh, you start getting the urge to walk quickly, uh, that's an indication that you are not using the thinking part of your brain. You're using the uh, panic flight response. And you're not gonna get good uh, clear thoughts and you're not gonna take good actions if you're using that part of your brain. That's why they tell you to stop whatever you're doing, take out a snack or get a drink, uh, sing a song, do something that's gonna deactivate that part of your brain and let the part of your brain that, that can reason uh, kick back in. And so if you look around the woods, there's actually a lot of things there that could serve as a source of shelter to you. And um, it can be limbs, it can be saplings, uh, it can be uh, boughs from uh, hemlock trees or pine trees, uh, the vines, grape vines, pipe vine, honeysuckle, uh, even green briar. Uh, all of these things can be used uh, to help uh, weave together a shelter that you can uh, use. Uh, logs, you know, you can lay uh, dead sticks along a log and then put those boughs on top of it. And that's probably the simplest shelter that you can come up with. But leaves for insulation, uh, even snow um, can, can be a source of shelter to you. So uh, just use your brain. And if you don't have things with you, improvise. Uh, you're, you're smart people, and I know that you can uh, think of some different ways to use things. And if not, we'll show you a few here in just a minute. All right, Bill, this is all you. Hey, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, different skills that you can develop. And before I do that, I'm going to back up just a second. And when you're going out on a hike, and, and I usually carry, unless I'm going on an all-day hike, I, I'll carry a very small bag. Uh, just a small shoulder bag, but typically I'll have down here in the lower right hand corner, I'll have a, a poncho that I got from an army surplus store. It's got grommets on it, very easy to convert that into an emergency shelter if, if need be. Um, even days when rain's not in the forecast, I'll have the yellow poncho uh, that you see here. You can pick that up in, uh, in the dollar store. I think it's about a dollar to, to get an emergency poncho like that. I will usually have a folding saw in my bag, some type of multi-tool that's got a saw on it, and that can all come in handy for emergency shelter building. Some other things that I don't usually carry on every hike, but things that could be useful uh, would be um, the white material you see there, that, that's just Tyvek. 
And uh, if you've ever seen a house under construction, you, you see that wrap that they use, it's Tyvek, and it, it makes an excellent emergency shelter. It's, um, you can't really go into Lowe's and Walmart, or used to, you couldn't. You can't, can't go in and just buy a small sheet. You have to buy a roll. But if you can find somebody building a house, they'll usually cut off a small piece that you can use as an emergency shelter. It's very lightweight. It's very durable. Uh, you can fold it up very small. Um, and there's also people who've, uh, very enterprising people who will buy the rolls and then sell you a, a piece of Tyvek on eBay or somewhere. Now, the one thing about Tyvek that you have to be aware of is water vapor can pass through it one way. And, and just to keep in mind how that works, if you think about that wrap around the house, if there's moisture inside that new house, you want that water vapor to be able to leave but not get back in. So, so the water can pass through one way. Um, also the Mylar blankets, the emergency space blankets that look like foil, those are very cheap. I think you can get those for a dollar or so. Uh, those can be used to make an emergency shelter. Uh, they, once they tear, they tear easily, but if you can prevent them from tearing, they, they do hold up pretty well. Um, down here in the lower left, this is just an industrial size garbage can liner. And that can also be useful to throw in your pack and, and use as an emergency shelter. But as we're going in to talk about skills and, and things that you can bring to the table when you go on a hike, uh, it doesn't really do you much good unless you've practiced with these things. So go out in your yard. Um, if, if you've got, uh, if, if you buy an emergency poncho, buy three of them. Buy, buy one to keep in your pack and have a couple more that you can practice shelter building in your backyard. Same with the, the trash can liner, same with the Tyvek. Test it out, uh, kind of learn what its limitations are as far as how much pressure you can put on that before it tears. And, um, you, know, you know, those kind of skills are things that you can certainly bring to the table and minimize your chances of being caught without any shelter whatsoever. One skill that I would highly recommend everybody learn is, is a knot called the taut line hitch. Uh, very, very easy to learn that. And the thing about the taut line hitch is um, when you tighten up a tarp or you tighten up a shelter with this particular knot, the wind moving that shelter is not gonna cause that knot to move. You can tighten it up where you want it and it's gonna stay. But you can squeeze the knot, you can make it tighter, you can make it looser. So, uh, so it's a pretty good one to know. Um, I've got a video here, um, and I had a 10-year-old little girl who told me later she had an ant crawling on her when she was trying to film this, so it may not be crystal clear, but you can find lots of instructions online to, to learn the top line hitch. We'll see if this video plays. But you make two loops inside, go, go through the loop twice, and then you come outside the loop and go back in. And that's what it looks like when, when you're finished. But, but again, you can slide it up, you can slide it down if you need to tighten it. If the wind picks up and you need to tension your tarp a bit, um, but, but I would encourage you to look online and find instructions and learn that particular knot because it's going to be a good one. Um, you know, even, even in your day to day, if you're tying a tarp over something in a pickup truck, that that's another one that can come in another time that that knot can come in handy. You want this one or you want me to? Um, I, I can talk about it if you want. You go um, right ahead. It, one of the things that uh, I think is very important if you're in a survival situation, if, you're, if you've gotten lost on a hunting trip, if you've been fishing and you've taken a, a dunk into the water, it's, it is really important to keep a positive attitude. Uh, you're going to have... Um, much better chance of dealing with a lot of these these challenges and you just got to keep in mind that you're going to have to accept a little bit of suffering you might be a little cold you might be a little damp uh, you might run across a few bugs but but that attitude is going to be a a major um, influencer on, on whether you survive 
a situation or you don't. So, so keeping a positive attitude, being very positive, uh, you have uh, many chances to, to survive. Even if you, if you're in a, a survival situation, you're, you're going to be okay, but you, you got to be positive about it. Um, yeah, I wanted to add something to that. Um, okay. Just to stress how important that is. I've got some people and in, in a present company is totally excluded from this uh, analogy that I'm going to relate, but I've had some folks that I've gone on, on hikes with before and uh, they were really stressful hikes. There were things that came up that, um, you know, really, really bad weather, really cold weather. And um, a person's ability to laugh about it, uh, to make a joke about it, or to say, you know, I can't wait to tell uh, what we've endured. Um, people that had that kind of attitude tended to not break. They bend, but they don't break. Those that start focusing on how bad it is and how miserable they are and uh, how they just can't stand the circumstances, those are the people that break. And after they break, um, they're, they're pretty well worthless. We've had some folks that have gone on trips with us um, that uh, you could tell when their breaking point was and they um, um, they were totally demoralized the rest of the trip. And this is what we're trying to avoid you slipping into. Don't get into that funnel thinking trap uh, where you start focusing on the negative instead of uh, keeping a, a good spirit about it. One of the major things, uh, one of the major motivations to, to keep in mind when it comes to your ability to construct a shelter and, and when it might be necessary to build a shelter is, is this whole concept of hypothermia. And, and hypothermia, what it is, is, is when your body heat leaves quicker than your body can produce it. And so your, your core temperature is going to drop to a dangerously low level. Um, it doesn't have to be freezing. You know, I've heard of people in, when the temperature's in the 50s uh, being uh, experiencing hypothermia. So it doesn't have to be winter weather. You could go out on a, some of the weather we've had lately where it's been in, in 50 degree weather. And if you get wet, then, uh, then, then you do have a chance of hypothermia. I used to have a scout master. He would say, it's okay to be a little bit cold. It's okay to be a little bit wet, but if you're cold and wet, then, then you've got a problem. And that's not a hundred percent accurate because you could be bone dry and still get hypothermia, but, but he made a very good point. If you can keep dry, then even when it's cold weather, you're going to, you're going to stand a much better chance of surviving. But with hypothermia, I think about 50% of the people in this country who die every year are, uh, 75 years of age or older, so they're they're not as likely to be able to regulate their body temperature. They're not if it gets too cold, then they're not going to be able to bring that temperature back. So the elderly are most at risk of hypothermia, but anybody can can suffer from from that. Some of the symptoms of hypothermia would be pale and waxy skin. Breathing will slow down. Um, the, the person with hypothermia will have a slowed and irregular heartbeat. And then the symptoms, they may also include slurred speech. Uh, I remember when I took my hunter safety course, we watched a video and this was supposedly a true story about a hunter who had um, gotten caught in the rain and, and then he fell in the river and, uh, and he ended up dying of hypothermia. But, uh, but one of the, the, ways that his, his buddies knew that he was experiencing that is he did have, have slurred speech. Often they'll be trembling on one side of the body, maybe just one arm or one leg will be shaking pretty violently. Uh, that could indicate that hypothermia is at play. Uh, the person may also experience dizziness or drowsiness, very low blood pressure, they may lose consciousness, and they may have a fleeting memory. They can't, they can't remember. Um, 
where they are or, or what time they were supposed to be back, a lot of those memories will go away. And that could signal that the person is, is dealing with hypothermia. So if you suspect hypothermia, you wanna get that person into a shelter, even if you have to put up an emergency shelter that we're talking about, get them out of the weather, uh, get them in some kind of dry situation, remove wet clothing, get, again, like my scoutmaster said, you don't wanna be cold and wet. You wanna to, want to get them into some dry clothing if at all possible. You want to warm their core. Don't worry about their their fingertips and their arms and their legs. You want to warm where their where their organs are. So get them wrapped in a blanket. Um, use skin to skin contact if you can. You might want to hug them pretty close to, to try to get that core temperature warmed up, if at all possible. Uh, if there's any kind of warm beverage, uh, certainly not any kind of alcoholic beverage, but uh, if if you have anything like hot tea or or coffee. Um, I remember the hunter safety course video, there was another story about a, a hunter suffering from hypothermia and when they found him, he had a thermos of hot coffee um, in his pack that he'd never even bothered to open. But that warm beverage can help, help uh, warm up that core temperature. Wrap the person in a blanket if you have one, uh, fleece jacket, and as soon as you can, try to get medical attention, just alert. Um, alert somebody, uh, uh, EMTs or someone that this person does need medical attention and they're possibly suffering from, from hypothermia. Talk a bit about siting the shelter, uh, trying to figure out where you're gonna locate this emergency shelter. Uh, shelter is not just for overnights. I've been in situations where I've been hiking and we get caught in a downpour in the middle of the day. And I remember in one case in the Smokies, we did stretch out a tarp and we sat underneath the tarp and just uh, let the rain pass. This time of year, especially, you'll get those isolated thunderstorms that'll come up and just dump a lot of rain. And if at all possible, if you can take the time to get into a shelter, you're, you're gonna stay a whole lot drier that way than if you try to deck out in rain gear and keep hiking. Uh, I, can, I can almost promise you that you, you'll put on a, your expensive rain suit or put on your poncho and, uh, and you're gonna generate a lot of moisture just from condensation. You're always gonna stay a little drier if you can just get under some type of shelter, even if it's just a tarp or, or something like that. Um, around here, we have a lot of rock shelters, a lot of overhangs that can get you out of the rain. Um, those can be useful. They, they do have some drawbacks though. Uh, Shad and I were talking earlier today. We were thinking about some of the common rock shelters that we know in this area. And after a heavy rain, sometimes those can be very wet. So if you're looking for a dry place to, uh, to warm up and, and get out of the weather, that may not be your best option. Another issue with a lot of those rock shelters is we have a lot of iron in the, the sandstone around here. So they're not exactly safe from lightning. Lightning can move through those iron deposits and, and you're not gonna be nearly as safe as you would be in say a car or a house. So, uh, so don't think of these rock shelters. If you get caught in a thunderstorm, don't think that that rock shelter is 100% gonna protect you from, from lightning because that's not always gonna be the case. There are also some issues and um, we were talking about a time that I, I stayed with a group in a rock shelter overnight. And early the next morning at about daylight, we started getting bombarded by hornets. We, uh, uh, there were hornets and there's some other uh, critters that you may run across in some of these rock shelters. So they can be useful for getting you just a temporary reprieve from a rain shower, but, um, but sometimes there may be better options than, than the natural shelters. Another thing that you wanna look at, you wanna look at the slope. If you're setting up an emergency shelter, you wanna think about the slope and the aspect or which direction that's facing. Um, you, you do wanna have a little bit of slope. You, I think as humans, we like to find that perfectly flat, almost like a table uh, place to set up our camp. But sometimes those flat, 
grounds will will puddle water. You don't know how water's going to react to that. So if you've got some a very slight slope, then that's going to help with drainage a bit. Um, also, just like with an orchard, we tell people as far as orchards and berry crops to put it on the side of a slope because the cold air will flow past. So you don't want to be in a low area where that cold air may puddle. But if you're on the side of a slope so the, the cold air can move by, then that's going to be uh, pretty helpful. We can also remember that the south facing slopes and west facing slopes tend to be a little warmer and a little drier than north and east facing slopes. Another thing to keep in mind when you're siting an emergency shelter is look for what we call widow makers, look for dead trees. And um, I was going to share a story about uh, a death that happened in my home county uh, last year, but it's just, it's just too sad of a story to, to, to tell, but it, it did involve a storm that came up and a, a dead tree that, uh, that, that cost a person their life. So, so that's something to really keep in mind when you're scouting out a place to camp or, or siting out a place for an emergency shelter, look around, um, try, to, try to take note of all those dead trees, anything that could cause some, some problems. And then finally, you wanna look, um, you know, keep your eyes open to things like uh, poison ivy, um, yellow jacket, hornet's nests, any kind of wildlife situations, look for bear signs around. Those are the types of things that you, you want to think about when you're siting a spot for an emergency shelter. I'm going to try to play this video. This is just looking at a, a site uh, actually up here behind my house here in Pound. So we'll see if we can play this. This is a location that could be ideal as far as the grade for an emergency shelter. And uh, it's, it's got just a little bit of a slope on it, not so much that you couldn't rest comfortably, but enough that water would certainly drain, cold air would move down the slope and past this particular location. But there is a major negative with this site and that's, that's over here. See, there's a, there's a dead tree here or a widow maker. And especially if we're in a situation where you're gonna get some winds and you're gonna get uh, some storms then that could be a problem. And a tree doesn't have to be very big to be a danger. You know, a smaller tree could also be, be fatal. So, uh, so when you're selecting a site, not only do you want to look at slope and aspect, but uh, check for those dead trees and anything that may, that may cause injury in the event of a storm. And it, it surprises me how many people that I've camped with in the past who will not think twice about having their tent or their tarp underneath a, a dead tree. Uh, I remember on the Pine Mountain once I was uh, camping with some folks and a, a, a fella who hadn't really camped that much. Uh, we, we came into an area uh, called the Doubles. I know Merle and Shad know where that's located and we knew that there was a heavy storm on the way and uh, we, we started setting up our tents. We, we were kind of uh, trying to get ready for the rain and the storms that, that were approaching. And I looked and this fella had, had actually tied his tarp onto a tree that had fallen and the, the top had gotten caught up in another tree and he'd tied his tarp directly underneath that. So it's just, uh, it, it's, it's really, it's, it sounds like common sense, but there are a lot of folks who really pay no, no mind whatsoever to, to those widow makers and those dead trees. Okay, Shad, I think this is, this is you again. Okay, so let me pause just for a second before I launch into the inventory and, and say that we're gonna assume that if we're talking about building a shelter that you are physically able to move and that you haven't injured yourself and uh, it's not a situation where you have to shelter in place, so to speak. Um, we're also assuming that uh, you're not trying to do this right in the middle of a storm, that you have had a little bit of forethought. If you heard thunder rumbling in the distance, uh, that you actually took steps uh, to, to uh, address the shelter needs before it was too late. Um, this might also apply if it's getting really late in the day. You know, you don't, uh, if it's summertime and uh, let's say it's getting dark at like uh, nine o'clock right now, you don't want to wait until 8:45 to decide. Oh, I guess I need to build something. 
uh, most of the things that we're going to talk to you about, you, you're going to need probably about um, somewhere between 30 minutes to an hour to build a decent shelter that's going to be able to protect you from the, the elements. So as we go into the, the inventory thing, you need to assess then, uh, after we already know that you're wanting to build a shelter, what's available? What do you have? Um, and what is around you kind of dictates uh, what you can do. You know, the, the thing that you have is better than the thing that you wish you had. And uh, so we're working with what is, not with what we wish we had. The, this uh, first set of uh, slides is going to assume that you have a tarp. And, uh, you know, when we first started talking about this, I was a little reluctant because if it's truly an emergency, you may or may not have a tarp. But uh, I'm going to assume that you followed Phil's trusty advice and that you have now included uh, a piece of Tyvek um, to, to your uh, day pack. And they don't have to have grommets, by the way. You can improvise a grommet as long as you have some rocks and some string. Uh, you can put a small rock in the corners and uh, tie a string around it, and it will function the same as a grommet. Uh, so if you've got fabric that you, you can't put those in, but you can get grommet kits. I think most folks know that. Um, and you can add grommets. Um, I, I haven't tried it, but Phil, do you know if you can add grommets to that Tyvek? I'm assuming it's tough enough that it could handle yes. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's, they're usually very cheap. I know we, my family just bought a grommet set uh, on Amazon and it's pretty cheap. Uh, but you can add to them. You know, if you've got an old tarp that the grommet has pulled out, you can always reinforce it with some duct tape and put a new uh, grommet in. But uh, this first one is going to be a wedge tarp. And you can see that they basically, it slopes to one side. And that's usually going to be in the direction of the wind or where you anticipate the wind is going to come from uh, so that it's not blowing the rain in on you. Um, it looks like all they've done here is they've staked down uh, the two bottom corners um, and then the, the top two they've got secured with string and then that central grommet they've tied to just a bush. So this is a very simple uh, way to get in out of the weather and uh, it's going to keep you dry and it's going to add a little warmth and you can do this very easily in 15 to 20 minutes. It, it shouldn't be a problem. This is just an, a, an example of one that is a modification of what we just saw. Uh, we did this one at the office today and it, I don't know if you can tell it, but if you look really close, you can see that there's actually a, a sapling that is bent over inside the, the uh, shelter. So we use that uh, sapling as a ridge pole and we had to score it just a little bit to get it to bend over, uh, but we just tied the, the sapling down and, and it made a big hoop. And I think you'll see that picture uh, shortly, but um, we weren't happy with the fact that uh, there was a lot of fabric hanging down. So we cut another stick and, and made kind of an A-frame out of it. So this, uh, you can do this a lot of different ways. This is uh, a wedge tarp that is just a slight modification of the first one that you saw. Um, keep in mind that if you're doing these, uh, Phil talked to you a little bit about the slope. This is important even if you have a tent. Um, that water is going to run off. And if there's the least little bit of a depression where you're going to lay that water will run back underneath the tarp and in on you. And so it's better if you've got some way to dig, even if it's just with a stick to gouge around it, to make a little uh, ditch around the perimeter that will divert that water away from the, the inside of the, the structure. Um, this particular photo, I think they're calling this uh, the burrito tarp. And uh, basically, you don't have to pitch anything. If you've got that tarp, you just roll it up, tuck the bottom in, and you've made like a sleeping bag out of it. 
and you just crawl into the tarp and it functions both as a, a bag and as your structure and you don't have to have any uh, additional rope. Uh, so if, if you find yourself out and you don't have a knife or you don't have a string, but you do have a tarp, uh, it could be as simple as this. You do want to do what Phil suggested earlier and make sure it's big enough. Uh, you know, if you've ever uh, tried to uh, use one of these throws on your couch as a blanket and you know you fight it all night long because it's not big enough, uh, the same thing will apply with the uh, tarp and you'll find that your head is sticking out in the rain or your feet are sticking out in the rain. And uh, so make sure that the, the tarp that you select is big enough. Uh, I would recommend uh, that you find something uh, in the, uh, the 10 to 12, uh, 10 by 12 range, as opposed to the six by eight. I think six by eight is a, a little small. Uh, Shad, if you don't mind, I'll kind of say something about, about this. This is sort of like a bivy uh, bag and um, you know, I showed you the picture earlier of the large trash can liner and I've, I've heard of people using those as a modified bivy bag and and that can work definitely keep you out of the elements in a in a dire emergency but what's going to happen with this kind of thing and, and with other things you're going to get a lot of condensation it's uh, if you're in an, in an arid place then um, you'd probably be okay but around here you're going to get pretty soaked and so what I've heard people doing when they've had to use something like this is just making it a point every couple hours or so to take a rag or take a bandana and try to wipe some of that condensation off the inside or, or you're going to get pretty wet. Really good point Phil uh, and I'll, I'll play off of that and say that when we were doing the uh, New York section of the AT we happened to be there during the rainiest day in New York State history. Uh, and we were at a place called the Bear Mountain Inn. And the shelter that we were at uh, was built into the side of a boulder. Uh, and it's the only one on the AT that is like that. And <clears throat> it, it seemed like a good idea, I guess, to somebody, but uh, that boulder actually funneled the water towards uh, the, the, the inside of the shelter. And uh, they, they had used uh, concrete or mortar uh, to try to seal some logs up there, but they had rotted out. So the head of the shelter um, was basically, um, if you've been to one of these fancy uh, hotels and they've got one of those uh, waterfall deals uh, in the lobby, uh, that's what this shelter had. It came complete with its own waterfall. <clears throat> and the, the foot side of it uh, was where the rain was blowing in and my sleeping bag was getting wet and I tried to use a, a garbage bag, like you mentioned, Phil, and that condensation totally soaked the foot of my sleeping bag. And it took, it was a down sleeping bag. And if you've never tried to dry out a down sleeping bag, it's not a, an easy thing to dry. And so um, his point was a very important one. <laughs> So this next one is an A-frame tarp. Um, it's a very simple uh, structure that's, um, it allows for ventilation. Uh, it's important if you do this that you keep it low to the ground. You can see that uh, there's potential for it to either drip down onto you or to, for the rain to blow in, um, or uh, you know, just there can be a lot of things that go wrong with this. So I would pitch it low and I wanna draw your attention to one thing here that the guy did that uh, um, I've got multiple books on emergency shelters and they all uh, have a photograph that is very similar to this one. And I, I see a, a critical problem with it. And that is that the string that they've got this pitched over top of is sloping down towards the, the tarp. And what's gonna happen is in the event of a big rain, that water is gonna hit that string and it's gonna run right towards the, the place where you're trying to sleep. So if you're gonna do this, uh, I'm gonna recommend that you make a slight modification and you'll see it in one of the later photos. Uh, but, but this is a very simple one. Um, Phil mentioned a uh, poncho earlier. The, the poncho that you see in this modified version of that A-frame 
is a um, army surplus poncho. If any of you remember the old army goods store that used to be in Jenkins, uh, that's where this poncho was purchased years ago. But it's kind of a rubberized fabric. There's grommets in the corners, which allow you to uh, stake it out. But um, I used the string just like uh, they did in the photo, but I added a stick uh, that props it up in the middle. It's still the stick, the base of the stick is on one outside edge of the, the uh, tarp or the poncho. So it's not in your way, but it's elevating the middle so that the water doesn't come on into the middle of your, your shelter. Um, this one is a, a tarp teepee. And, uh, you know, this, I, I think if I were going to use this, this would be uh, in the event that uh, it was probably really cold weather and I was trying to, to sit in a very small space. Uh, you would have to have a pretty decent sized tarp to be able to make a big enough tarp teepee to actually lay down in. Um, but this one, you can do it several different ways. You can cut a pole uh, that you brace and you wrap the, the tarp around that pole. Uh, you can use a sapling that you wrap this around. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it's just a, a, again, this is a very quick setup. So if, if you're about to get caught by bad weather, this might be the fastest way uh, to seek shelter. <laughs> this is one that we pitched at the office today, and um, I don't know if you can really see it from the photo, uh, but this is one where you, um, you, you hang the tarp you find the middle of the tarp and you throw a, a rope over an overhanging tree limb, hopefully one that's sturdy, and uh, you can put a rock in the middle of that tarp and tie it off and use it like a grommet. And then you just uh, stake out the corners of the tarp. And we weren't happy with the way that this one was hanging, so we added uh, some props to the, uh, the middle of the tie downs. And, uh, you know, that was a pretty, pretty good size shelter that would work for a couple of people, maybe even three in a pinch. And uh, this one is a little high off the ground. This is another one that if I were you, I would lower it down. And uh, you can see something else in that photo. Uh, one of the poles that we used was a poplar sapling and uh, the bark is slipping right now. And so depending on the time of the year that you're out, if you've got a knife and you, you need rope or something to tie with, but you don't have anything, you can strip the bark off a lot of these trees and weave it uh, or tie it into lengths of rope uh, that you can use as your tie downs or uh, any number of things. So that's kind of improvised rope. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. This picture probably should have been at the very beginning of the presentation because this is the simplest uh, shelter that you can find. And that is to find a dense evergreen tree and get under it. Uh, it will stay dry under a hemlock tree for a very long time. If it, if it was dry prior to the onset of the rain. Um, now, if it's been raining for a number of days, uh, you know, it uh, might not be the case but it tends to, the, the needles of the hemlocks tend to build up. And because they build up, it tends to not be as wet uh, as it could be in other places. It also tends to be a little soft, generally under a hemlock tree. So that's a nice, usually dry, usually soft uh, place to get in out of the weather. And um, I didn't do it under a hemlock tree, I did it in a cedar tree. But if you're in limestone country where there's a lot of uh, red cedar, um, you can get in a red cedar tree or up under one and cut some of the lower branches off of it. <clears throat> and it'll keep you dry for hours and hours. I rode out a really big, heavy, wet snow one deer season. Uh, I was under this tree for like 12 hours and I was totally dry under the cedar tree. This is just a picture of some honeysuckle vine. And I want you to think about uh, what you could use vines for if you didn't have rope. 
Um, I actually tied down a structure that you're going to see here in a minute with this piece of honeysuckle vine. But, uh, you know, this is a, an introduced non-native, so you're most likely to find it in disturbed places that are already kind of close to civilization. So it might not be as useful, but pipe vine uh, could be used. Uh, grape vines, uh, depending on how limber they are, they can be used. Um, if you've got uh, a knife and can uh, knock the, the needles off of them, uh, greenbrier can be used. So you can improvise uh, rope if you don't have any. And, and this is just a picture of some of those uh, strips of the poplar bark that have been, uh, I just used a square knot and uh, tied those pieces together and um, there's probably better knots uh, to use and maybe that'll be another uh, Zoom meeting in the future, Phil, but um, I, I was just trying to give folks the idea of what they might use as rope. Anybody that's ever sat in a cane bottom chair knows that if you've got access to hickory cane, uh, uh, that's basically what they did. They stripped the bark and they wove it into a seed. Uh, this picture goes with that earlier uh, A-frame or wedge uh, shelter, and that's just where we bent the sapling over and secured it with rope, and then we threw the, the tarp over the sapling. This is just, uh, we built a A-frame a or a, um, uh, what's that leaf hut, I think was the other name for it. And that's, this is how I secured the pole to the tree was with the, the honeysuckle vine. And it, it worked very well. And this is just a picture of us assembling um, uh, a totally natural shelter. So if if you find yourself out and you have uh, no knife, uh, you have uh, no rope, you have no tarp, um, and, and nothing really to work with, you can still build something. Uh, you can take, uh, you can find a, a tree that has fallen. Uh, sometimes it'll be a standing sapling that died, but it's still got some strength to it. And you can lay that into the forks of another tree. In this instance, I was using a hemlock tree that has branches that are low. And uh, I've even seen people uh, break over a, uh, a hemlock tree, just uh, climb up in it and kind of weigh it down and break it and use it that way. But uh, you can just use dead sticks then and you're just laying them on both sides of this. And then you're gonna start breaking uh, pine uh, boughs off and laying those in. You're gonna lay them upside down. And the reason why you do it that way is so that it funnels the water away from you. If you lay them upright, it actually catches the water and, and directs it into the uh, shelter. So make sure you flip them upside down and uh, the, the, the top of it is the base of the limb. This is just kind of showing that a little bit better. And uh, this one outer one, I've got it the wrong way, but all the others were uh, turned the way that I told you about. And uh, it, it, it rained in Whitesburg today. We got a pretty good rain. And I went back and looked at this uh, with Phil and it was still dry uh, under that after a pretty decent little rain. So uh, the thicker you make it, the drier you're gonna be. If you don't put enough limbs on it, though the rain will get to you. But if you if you put enough layers on there, that will keep you unbelievably dry. I think there's yeah, and that's a picture from the base of it looking back into it. And you want to make sure that it is dry all the way. Uh, you know, if this is uh, spring or fall and the temperatures are going to drop, you want to make sure that it's keeping you totally covered. Uh, you don't want to find out that you've got frozen feet uh, because you didn't put enough uh, down low or, or that you're getting wet in the face. This is the leaf hut, which is basically the same thing as what we just looked at, but instead of using the, uh, the hemlock uh, 
boughs, they're using leaves. And so um, this, this is just to show you that, you know, you're not always going to find yourself in a place that has ready access to all the building materials that we've used. So you have to improvise. And in this case, they used a lot more of the vertical uh, ribs and then they just layered on bunches and bunches and bunches of leaves. And, you know, if you add enough leaf litter to that, it would have to rain for a really long time uh, for you to get wet in there. Is this the Round Lodge, I think is the name of this one. Um, and it, it, it kind of reminds you of a teepee. If I were going to build this, it would be because I was going to be there for uh, a while. And uh, you would probably need to have access to a saw. And this would be a structure that would be really well suited um, for a prolonged stay for multiple people uh, and one that you could uh, build a fire on the inside of uh, because it's going to funnel the smoke just like a, a teepee. If you've watched enough Westerns, uh, this is going to uh, allow you to have a heat source inside the structure. And uh, so another uh, name for this uh, is uh, a wiki up, I think is one that's real similar to this. Um, is this the wiki up? Okay. So they've just uh, insulated it with leaves. It's the same basic structure. Um, but uh, again, he's, he's working on building his fire in the middle of it. I would be cautious, uh, personally, um, if I were going to build a fire in the one that had the leaf insulation. <laughs> um, if you got it too warm and dry in there and you had an ember that went up into your leaves, uh, that could go very bad. Uh, so <laughs> you might have to make a, a break for it, but uh, I, I think, you know, as long as you keep the fire under control, uh, this would be just fine. I've, I've seen the uh, Kentucky Division of Forestry uh, when they were doing uh, fire watches on top of Pine Mountain there near the um, uh, Flamingo shelter. I have seen them uh, build a wiki up before, just I think out of boredom, uh, but they made this big massive wiki up and they would play cards uh, in that wiki up while they were sitting waiting to be called out on uh, a fire duty. And so um, <laughs> I thought it was a good use of their time and it was interesting to get to see it. It was very elaborate too, I, I might add. I think they added benches and everything. This is another very simple one that you could put together very quickly and uh, it's just a lean to. And in this instance, they have uh, used a, um, a pole to just lay things against it on one side. Um, probably another way of doing this that would be a, a very simple shelter would be if you found a big log that was laying on the ground and just laid those sticks. You know, we're going to assume that this log is uh, the the diameter of it is as uh, wide as you would want the height of your shelter to be. So it would need to be a pretty good size log or even a rock, uh, but you could lay those sticks um, as a lean-to and then add the, the cedar or the, the hemlock or the pine uh, to try to uh, waterproof it. I've seen a lot of coon hunters use something like that one. Um, this one here is called a, a Quincy. And, um, uh, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I grew up here in Jenkins and um, I always wanted a snow that was big enough to build an igloo. And um, the closest we ever came to it was when I was a kid, I went through the, the 77, 78 uh, snows. And if, if you all are old enough uh, to remember those snows and if you lived around here, they were epic. Um, and it got bitter cold. Uh, those were probably the only snows that we've had that would allow somebody to make a snow cave uh, or something like that. Igloos uh, are made out of ice, and so uh, that's not something that we really would have access to around here. That's, they would actually cut blocks of ice and build those. But a quitsy is, uh, they basically, um, you, you 
you've got several ways you can do it. You can either just make a big pile of snow and then dig it out, or you can uh, accelerate the process by if you've got a backpack or, uh, or something like that, that you lay on the ground and I'm going to assume that you've got uh, something waterproof to put over it, like your jacket. And then you're going to bury that with snow. And so, um, you know, as far as what you use to gather that snow, uh, it's going to be your hands. Um, you know, you, I'm assuming you've got gloves on and this may take a little uh, time to do. Uh, when, when I did it, I had a snow shovel, so it was a pretty fast process. Uh, but if not, uh, I think you could improvise uh, something with a, a wide piece of wood, maybe a piece of bark as a shovel. But you, you basically pile the snow up and then dig in, get your backpack and drag it out. And so the reason for doing that is you've already created this void that's in there. Um, but before you start doing the digging, you, you're gonna add about two feet of snow uh, on top of that at least. And then you're gonna lay sticks all along the, the outside of it. And those are going to kind of serve as your depth gauge. And then you're going to add more snow on top of those sticks. So when you crawl in, after you've pulled your, your um, backpack out, you're going to crawl in there and you're going to dig up until you start hitting those sticks. And those sticks are your depth gauges so that you know that you've left enough snow beyond the sticks to support the weight of the, the quidsy. And so uh, my daughter and I did this in our front yard. Um, I think it was in 2016. Uh, we got a, a really big snow, if you guys remember. And um, we, we made one of these and it lasted for days. And uh, it got down, I was telling Phil earlier today, the, the night that we built this and over the next several nights, it got down in the single digits. I think one of the nights it got down to like five degrees. And we got up in this thing just to see what it would be like. And it was toasty warm just from our body heat inside the, the structure. And, uh, you know, in an emergency situation, you would uh, put your backpack or something in front of that hole. Uh, you don't want to seal it totally off. You don't want to asphyxiate inside the structure. But you, if there's a wind blowing, uh, you know, make sure that the hole is on the opposite side of where you think the wind is going to come from. And uh, if the wind shifts, then just make sure you've got something that will kind of seal the opening off. But this is a really effective uh, structure uh, to build uh, if you find that all you've got to work with is snow. This one is a, an actual snow cave. And um, I, I was a little reluctant to put it in there, but I don't know where you guys might travel to. And uh, you know, if you go up north, uh, or different places. Uh, this is just what you would do if you were uh, building a, an actual snow cave. And so you dig in, you go down, and it's, it's kind of like a, a drain trap on a sink. Uh, you go down and then come back up. And that is to uh, uh, keep the warmth up where the little sleeping platform is. And so this one is very elaborate and it assumes that you have taken a snow shovel. And most folks that are snowboarding or skiing or, or backcountry uh, snowshoeing take one of these little backpacker uh, roll up uh, shovels with them. And so <clears throat> that's what you would use uh, to build this. And really in the right setting, this would be better than a tent. One last thing, I guess, is uh, some reference uh, references that we might want to uh, refer you to. And um, the, the first one I, I think is a dandy and I showed this one to Phil earlier today, but this is by Outdoor Life and it's uh, called uh, Prepare for Anything. And the uh, author's name is Tim uh, McWelch and the editors of Outdoor Life. But that, if, if you're a prepper type person, uh, that is an excellent book. It's, uh, it's full color. I don't know if you all can see all of that, but uh, it's, it's got 338 really good points in it. And uh, sad to say, some of the stuff that they wrote about uh, is timely, uh, given the circumstances in the country right now. So um, 
pretty interesting if you find yourself in riots or anything. Uh, but there is a, an SAS um, survival handbook that's by John Wiseman that is a, a very good reference book. Uh, there's another one called Camping and Wilderness Survival that's by uh, Paul uh, Tallrell, and it's T-A-W-R-E-L-L. -L. And then um, if you're a Boy Scout or you uh, find yourself in a, a, an old bookstore and come across an old Boy Scout handbook, um, the one that has the uh, pictures uh, by Norman Rockwell on the cover, those are still excellent. Uh, Phil tells me that the current ones uh, deal more with self-esteem and, and uh, that kind of thing. And I, I joke that uh, knowing how to do stuff is what gives me self-esteem. Um, <laughs> so I, I really like the old one. And, and the one I've got is my original one from the Scouts back in 79 and the early 80s. Uh, but those are really good references. Phil, do you have anything you want to? Uh, just that uh, I, I mentioned this to you today, in addition to the Boy Scout handbook, the field book. Uh, oh, yeah. That you, you can pick up in, in some used bookstores. It also has a, actually has a little more outdoor skill related things than, than even the handbook. So it's, a, it's another one to keep an eye open for. Is it as expensive as the handbook is on Amazon? Uh, well, I haven't priced on Amazon, but uh, when I bought this, uh, <laughs> you know, it, I'm sure it was expensive to me at the time as a, as a kid. But uh. The uh, handbook, I looked for them on Amazon, and the prices for a used paperback handbook, like I've got, started at $92. I could, okay. Yeah. I saw those eyes, Merle. That's about what I thought. And they, believe it or not, they went all the way up to 400 and something. And I thought you would have to be just a crazy collector to put that kind of money into an old book. But um, anyway, if you get lucky and find one in a, a bookstore, that, that might be the, the place to look. This, uh, the first one I showed you, I got it at Cabela's. And I think it was like 20, 20 or 30 bucks. And it had all kinds of things in it. So, questions or comments? Phil, when are you going to schedule us a, an overnight uh, survivalist camp? We need to uh, do well, it. We got to get just the perfect weather to do that. It has to be, uh, you know, a, a high of 60. A, uh, 65 and a low of 60 and no rain in the forecast and uh, that's uh, we'll have to we'll have to find a good day thank you jakita i was going to uh, comment earlier that uh, uh you were talking about it doesn't have to be really cold uh, i've had hypothermia three times in my life and uh, one of them uh, was deer hunting out in the middle of a cornfield uh, with a cold wet rain I got the slurred speech. I was confused. Um, <clears throat> and the only thing that brought me back out of it was hot chocolate. And uh, the second time that I got it, I was hiking with Ross and we were, uh, he, he wasn't able to go on one of the hikes that we did um, that was down near uh, Hot Springs, North Carolina. And the first night out, um, it was, uh, or the whole day, it was just a cold drizzle that was probably around 50, uh, 52 degrees. And when we got to the shelter, my blood sugar was low. And so if you're, if you're somebody that tends to have your blood sugar drop, um, that will set you up for hypothermia as well. And, uh, but I got in there and I was just, um, Sometimes hikers will call it uh, bonging. Uh, it's basically where your, your sugar bottoms out and you just kind of go into this uh, daze. And I, I was sitting in the shelter. I wasn't talking. Um, I was shivering uh, and my, my teeth uh, were chattering. I couldn't quit, uh, you know, my teeth wouldn't quit uh, chattering. And, uh, and that wasn't from talking, Merle. That was uh, actually from being cold. But um, I could not, I, I didn't have enough energy to even get up from where I was to get in a sleeping bag. Uh, that's how, how bad off I was. 
And so had he not been there, I don't know that I would have made it. Uh, and he asked me, did I want some hot chocolate? And I was able to just kind of shake my head and he made hot chocolate and that brought me back out of it. So if I was gonna have a, another little thing in a day pack, especially if I thought I was gonna be out during the, the cooler seasons, it would be some way to heat water and make hot chocolate. Okay, so show of hands, how many of you are ready to, to go out and, and build uh, your own uh, primitive shelter? Do you think you could do it now? Merle, Merle could do it. Merle can do anything. Aaron said he could do it. Anybody else? It's kind of an informal survey here. Uh, I'm wondering if Kurt and Aaron have uh, maybe some experience with backcountry shelters. Is that... Is that a fair assumption? No, not really. <laughs> okay. okay. Learned so much in the video. They do also make, Phil, we didn't mention this, but they make a, uh, uh, those emergency bivvies that you, mm -hmm. I think the company is SOS, uh, yes. but those are pretty cheap. And that serves the purpose. I think it's like a reflective material on the inside and it's blaze orange. So if you're lost, it helps people find you. But uh, that is your warmth and your structure all rolled into one. And I think it's, it's big enough or long enough that you can get down in it. Um, so. Yeah, I, I have one of those in my truck, and it's it's very very tiny, very lightweight. Just it compresses really tightly, and and it's sort of a step up from the mylar blankets because it's already sealed in a like you said a total enclosure. So, when Bill went out of business uh, from Pine Mountain Outfitters, uh, mm -hmm. that's where I got mine, and um, it, it was exactly the one you're talking about. And to me, uh, you couldn't ask for a better thing to to have in a, a day pack. Right. Now we did uh, have a comment. Mm -hmm. You want to read that to us, Phil? Okay. Uh, Jaquita had said uh, she once heard a scoutmaster advise that taking a Snickers bar in your bag is a good item to have because of the protein and carbs. And that's absolutely true. Uh, if, if you eat something uh, at bedtime, something like that, that's going to your body's going to be using a lot of energy and creating a lot of energy to digest that type of stuff. And yes. Yes, that, that can generate some heat and keep you warmer. Um, uh, another thing that, that a lot of backpackers will do is, is pour some hot water into a, a bottle uh, at bedtime and, and wrap that in a, a, a shirt or something and, and sleep with that between your knees or, or against your stomach just to kind of help, help keep you a little bit warmer. What about hand warmers and toe warmers? That works. Yeah. For, for as long as they last. What, well, what's, I mean, it would help in an emergency. It would. What's the lifespan on one of those? Like an hour or two? No, six hours, I thought. Six hours? All right, that works. Especially I've, if you got cold toes. I've always said I'm going to sew an adult size onesie out of hand warmers. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that would, that would keep you warm for a while. <laughs> They make a emergency sleeping bag that you can buy that's uh, like a mylar that you can just slide down in it, don't unzip or not, but it's emergency for right. not too awful much. Right. The ones uh, we were talking about usually run about 30, I think, for the, the little bibby sack that uh, it seemed like that's about what they were. What they are. The, now they're waterproof yeah. and everything. You don't have to do anything to slide in it, they say. What, one thing I'll mention kind of along those lines is I've, I've known some people that keep a, an actual sleeping bag uh, in, in their, their gear, in their vehicle, or in a, a bag. And the only negative about that is especially with down bags or even synthetic bags, when they're compressed for a long time, they lose a lot of their loft. And so even after trips, uh, one of the things that's recommended is you take those out and, and just let them fluff and let them stay op open. So if you've got a, a bag compressed in a, 
a sleeping bag compressed in a backpack for very long, uh, once you need it, it may not have the insulation that you need it to have. I was going to say about those emergency bivvies too, and the emergency, like the Mylar stuff. This is for an emergency. This is going to keep you from freezing to death, but don't expect that it's going to be like staying at the Ritz and uh, you're going to be a toasty 70 degrees in there. If it worked that way, we would all be wrapped up in emergency blankets at the house. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to raise the temperature maybe 15 or 20 degrees uh, over whatever it is outside, maybe a little more than that, but it's not going to just uh, make it balmy. I don't expect that. Yeah, when I was in seventh grade, I just saw uh, Rambo. And uh, me and my cousin went out for a, an overnighter in 50 degree weather. And I said, I'm just going to take a, take a survival knife and a, a Mylar blanket. And uh, it just got in the fifties, but it's one of the coldest nights I've ever, ever spent. So I, I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> okay. Any more? All right. Good job. Thank you, Merle. Yep. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Phil. All right. I hope you all will join us uh, Thursday evening. Uh, our presenter will be, remind me, Shad, who's our presenter Thursday evening? What, what was the subject again? Gardening. Gardening, right? Ain't it? Uh, fall gardening, yes. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's so bad. Hope, so hope you all can come back then, and uh, and thank you for joining us tonight. Everybody have a good evening. Hey, Bill, you ain't getting hypothermia, are you? I could be. Yeah. Dilution there. And I'm forgetting. <laughs> That's, that's that's entirely possible. That, that could be happening. I have to turn down the AC a little bit. There you go. Good seeing you all. You too.